The Lord be with you. We're grateful for your presence this morning, sharing with us worship online and remotely. We hope before very many weeks to be able to be back in each other's presence, but to a certain degree, of course, the uh, ability to do that depends upon the pandemic numbers. So we're watching that. We're making plans as we move through Lent and toward Holy Week and Easter. So we will keep you apprised of how our considerations go. Even though we are separated by uh, miles and hours possibly uh, in, the, in this worship service, please know that in the weeks that we are not physically worshiping at First Presbyterian Church in Bryan, uh, in the building, that the sanctuary is open on Sunday mornings from 1045 until 1130 for prayer and meditation. We have music playing in the sanctuary and there is the opportunity to share in partaking of the Lord's Supper. And, and all are welcome at that time. Our pastors Emily and Ted are here and we would be uh, privileged to share that time in meditation and prayer with you. There are two announcements that relate to the life of the church. One is about the overall uh, journey of Lent. Our Lenten devotional books in hard copy should be in maybe by the time that you hear this announcement, uh, but certainly by early in the week. And those hard copies will be available at the church office. You need simply to call or drop by and we can provide those with you. However, they will still also be online. And that's uh, that's the primary way that we are communicating with each other and in each other's presence at this time, www.fpcbrian.org. And on our Facebook page, those devotionals are available. And lastly, on Monday, March 1st, is the deadline for signing up for the March 6th Saturday uh, work and mission event at the Brazos Valley Food Bank, leaving from the church about 9.35 in the morning on Saturday, driving out to the Brazos Valley Food Bank to participate in a couple of hours of ministry outreach with others. Emily, uh, Pastor Emily Bagan, needs to know uh, that you will be planning to attend by noon on Monday, March the 1st. So please give her a call at the church office and, and sign up. It is a great intergenerational event. Friends, again this morning, uh, with all of God's people, we are worshiping God, and we are honored to be serving Jesus Christ together. Comforts and heals us. 
Come to worship God who gives forgiveness. Let us worship God who sets us free and gives us new life. Would you join us in singing together? Come, live in the light. to the first book of John, chapter 1, verse 6, we hear a beautiful promise from the Lord our God. The Lord our God is a just and merciful God, faithful to remove us of all of our transgressions. Thanks be unto God. And with that in mind, let us engage in our prayer of confession. Merciful and loving Lord, ever-present and all-knowing, you feel our pains and you witness our sufferings. You hold us close when we cannot hold ourselves together. You love us every minute of every day and never turn away, though we may be unsightly. Lord, forgive us when our lack of compassion is what is unsightly. When our strength is used to bypass the weak, rather than to lift them up. Forgive our misunderstandings of your will and forgive our reliance upon the limitations of the law, keeping us from acts of radical love. Help us to know empathy for the friend and stranger alike. Empower our hearts to never tire of loving another person. We come to you in silence as we ponder these things in our hearts and bring to you what weighs heavy this week. Amen. Friends, we are liberated in the gospel news according to Jesus. The love of Jesus and God's amazing grace for us all. Living in the promises of God that God is merciful and forgiving, let us rejoice and be glad.
Let us now attune our hearing to the word of God, an ancient word, though fresh enough to be appropriated in our day and time. The word of God read from Job chapter 2, verses 11 through 13. Now when Job's three friends heard of all of these troubles that had come upon him, each of them set out from his home. Eliphaz the Tamanite, Bildad the Shumite, and Zophar the Naamanite. They met together to go and console and comfort Job. Now when they saw him from a distance, they did not recognize him. And they raised their voices and they wept aloud. They tore their robes and threw dust in the air over their heads. They sat with him on the ground seven days and seven nights, and no one spoke a word to him, for they saw that his suffering was very, very great. This is the word of God. Friends, this is a reading from the Gospel according to Luke, chapter 13, beginning at verse 10. Now he, he being Jesus, was teaching in one of the synagogues on the Sabbath. And just then there appeared a woman with a spirit that had crippled her for 18 years. She was bent over and was quite unable to stand up straight. When Jesus saw her, he called her over and said, Woman, you are set free from your ailment. When he laid his hands on her, immediately she stood up straight and began praising God. But the leader of the synagogue, indignant because Jesus had cured her on the Sabbath, kept saying to the crowd, there are six days on which work ought to be done. Come on those days and be cured, and not on the Sabbath day. But the Lord answered him and said, you hypocrites, does not each of you on the Sabbath untie his ox or donkey from the manger and lead it away to give it water? And ought not this woman, a daughter of Abraham, whom Satan has bound for 18 long years, ought not she to be set free from this bondage on the Sabbath day? When he said this, all his opponents were put to shame. And the entire crowd was rejoicing at all the wonderful things he was doing. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Well, after hearing from both pastors uh, George and pastors Ted, you may be wondering, what do these two texts have in common? After all, they're from wildly different times and even different regions of the world. So why have we chosen this text from Job and this text about Jesus together for today? As we explore Job and Jesus together, we may find that we have more questions than answers in the end. And that's not a bad thing. I remember as I was sitting down with Pastor Ted to discuss what we were going to do for Lent in regards to our sermons, he was very excited about this idea of Job and Jesus together and exploring those pathways. At first, as soon as I heard the word Job, I had more of a gag reaction. I mean, to purposefully seek out a story that is dark and about suffering and about God's role in it, after the year that we've had, heck, after the last few weeks that we've had, why would I want to dive deeper into this? But friends, there was something that I was missing out on, quite frankly. And it's that especially now, we have so much that we can learn from Job. If we approach Job with openness, vulnerability, and curiosity, I think that there's a lot in there, especially for us, as we can begin to sort of empathize with some of what he was going through. So again, what do these two texts have in common? Well, I'd like to bring them both for a moment into a more modern day scenario. A little girl was coming home late from supper one evening 
It was getting dark and the street lights were already on. So naturally her mother was getting anxious. Soon she sees her little girl running down the sidewalk with her bike into the driveway and up to the garage where her mother was standing. And her mother made the expected irate parents demand to know where she had been. The little girl unsnapping her helmet and parking her bicycle, she replied that she had stopped to help Janie whose bicycle had broken in a fall on the way home. Janie had swerved her bike just a little too quickly and she had fallen down onto the pavement. The front tire had dented and the chain of the bicycle came off and was sitting on the asphalt beside her. Janie had begun to cry, examining her bicycle and picking up the chain in her scraped palms, sobbing over the wreckage. The mother interrupted, but you don't know anything about how to fix a bicycle. And the little girl responded, I know that. I just stopped to help her cry. Janie was one lucky duck of a friend to have this little girl to help her cry. You know, empathy is one of the greatest aspects of compassion, and that's what makes us human. To recognize another's pain, acknowledge it, and sit in solidarity with it is a language of love. When Job's friends came upon him that day thousands of years ago, I imagine they must have walked a long path through his fig trees and olive orchards to get to his home, which at, what time, at one time had been filled with the sounds of joyous laughter of his wife and his many children. The air would have been filled with the sounds of grazing livestock, braying sheep and baby goats. But on this day, as they came around the last trees, they would have seen a scene of absolute devastation. The house would have been in shambles because the roof had collapsed, killing Job's children. Job's wife would have been somewhere in the distance, encountering grief in her own way, as she had just told Job that he should denounce God in anger. And Job's animals, they would have been dead where they once stood, flies buzzing over an otherwise silent scene. And there was Job, clothes ripped and ashes smeared all over his body, as that was the custom way to mourn. They would have been shocked, because Job was known as one of the most blessed men in all of their society. He had it all. He was the most righteous and most pious man in all of their country. When they came upon him, they did not speak. They too ripped their clothes and covered themselves in ash. And they sat next to him, mourning for several days. To be honest, this is actually my favorite part of Job because it's the only part of Job where everything is being done correctly. Nothing has been messed up yet except for Job's life. <laughs> but Job's friends, in just simply being there, they were loving him correctly. They were showing him empathy in the worst time of his life. They met a great need in Job's darkest hours. They ensured that he not need to grieve alone, just as the little girl had done with Janie when she had wrecked her bike in the street. At least Job's friends met his need until they didn't. By opening their mouths in unwarranted judgment towards Job, speculating what he must have done to have deserved such a tragedy to befall him, they caused further isolation and harm to Job. You see, Job's situation was so shocking that they figured there had to be a reason for his despair. There had to be something that he had done to deserve this. Being from a land renowned for its wisdom, they used their rationale, which is very similar to that found in the book of Proverbs or Ecclesiastes. You get what you deserve. It is fair and it is just. Right? Well, the wisdom says that everything happens for a reason. Because of Job's sin, he must have been punished. Sure. Okay, logical. 
Except Job didn't do anything. In fact, he was being punished because he had done everything right. But nobody in the story actually knows that, except for God and the Satan who appear before this text. And so his friends berate him, telling him to confess, to make things right with God again. Job refused to hear more of this, telling them to go away. But oh, they were only using the wisdom of what was written. Surely that makes it okay, right? Can you imagine walking into the hospital room of a dying child and turning to the mother and saying, everything happens for a reason? It's disgusting, isn't it? And unfortunately, it happens all too often. People say this all the time, and they think that they're being kind. They think that they're being helpful, and they do it with the best of intentions. But it is harmful, and quite honestly, just bad theology. Truly, it is better to say nothing at all. Sometimes the best pastoral care ever given is just by sitting down and being quiet. The ways in which we care for and engage others when they are in pain can speak a lot of the ways in which we understand God's word. Now, in our Luke text today, in our story about Jesus, we see a leader of the synagogue, the clergy, telling Jesus that he is wrong to heal a suffering woman because it's the Sabbath day of the week. Again, to put this into perspective, I want you to imagine that your dog has broken its leg and is crying out in pain. And you look at it and you say, Oh, but it's Saturday, so I can't help you. Maybe tomorrow. Well, first of all, if you ever said that, you should be reported for abuse. But secondly, we all know that that is just wrong. No matter what day it is, no matter what the religious rules say, there are some things that are far more important. But what these scenarios demonstrate is why the Bible and the laws within it are not always hard and fast. In many cases, honestly, they are truly better treated as mere guidelines or best practices. There are many who might argue that the Bible must be taken literally as God's word and not to be disobeyed. But texts like this one presented in Luke today refute that theology. God and Christ prioritize the love of others over the law of religion. God's love is progressive and multicolored. It's not black and white and stuck in time. Two weeks ago, I was having some fun reading a book called Half-Truths by Adam Hamilton. He brought a brilliant example for the need of progressive theology to light in discussing the issue of Deuteronomy chapter 23, verses 12 and 13. It reads, You shall have a designated area outside the camp to which you shall go. With your utensils, you shall have a trowel, and when you relieve yourself outside, you shall dig a hole with it and then cover up your excrements. Friends, this text is about where to go to the bathroom. And in the year 1880, this text was used by multiple denominations, multiple churches throughout the United States to battle against indoor plumbing, against having a toilet in your house. <laughs> this is a prime example of thinking beyond the pages needing to happen of allowing societal rules of man hundreds of thousands of years ago to hinder us from the very specific and different circumstances of today. So how will we engage scripture? Do we engage it with our minds? Or do we treat it as a one-size-fits-all, simply-add-water recipe for our lives? Maybe if we repeat it loudly enough, it will address every single situation, right? Wrong. God is moving. The story is continuing. We are a part of that continuing story of the Bible. It's not over. There are real people right here and right now needing compassion, love, and understanding. 
Scripture is not a sword. It is a guide. It's not our overlord and master, but it is informative, not prescriptive. Compassion is what we are called to give when we engage others. Mindfulness is what we are called to have when we engage scripture. We all know that God is probably not against having a toilet in your house. But can you imagine using scripture to battle such a thing? We also know from Luke that God does not take issue with doing good deeds on the Sabbath day, when doing things that help others and love others. What God does take issue with is avoiding and ignoring the suffering of others because of some religious rule. We also see this in the story of the Good Samaritan. People pull out technicalities to use them as a way of avoiding what God wills for us, to love our neighbor. To love our neighbor and to love God, that is the most important thing that we can do. And there's no hierarchy to those rules. The way in which we engage the word of God and the way we engage the people of God can work together to create a beautiful way of life. If we live in a way that Jesus has shown us, with the Bible in one hand and the hand of our neighbor in the other, then we can walk the path of God. To love our neighbor is to love God. Job's friends initially engaged with Job in a way that met him where he was, acknowledged his grief, and shared the burden of its weight with him. Jesus saw a suffering woman and healed her because it is the right thing to do and the best way to love her as another of God's children, not because of what day of the week it was. We are called as followers of Christ to lead empathetic, kind, and caring and compassionate lives. To engage others with compassion first and foremost is the way that God created us and hoped that we would continue to grow to be. It's okay to break the rules sometimes in order to meet a fellow human where they are and lift them up when they have fallen. Like the little girl and Janie, Sometimes being late for dinner is less important than helping a friend to cry. Friends, after a year like this, after the last few weeks even, many of us probably have a little crying to do ourselves. Now more than ever, we are called to engage each other in compassion and great love, to set the rule book aside on the table for a while and let your heart take the wheel. It may steer you in places that you'll cherish forever, places that you'll find God alive and near to us, those thin places. We are called to stand by in solidarity as God stands with us and to allow God to move within us and take us over and consume us so that this world can be more kind, more loving. So how will we engage one another? How will we engage scripture? These are the things that we must meditate on this Lent. I invite you to do so with me. Amen. Would you join us in singing the chorus, Open the eyes of my heart, Lord.
Friends, let us pray. We give you our thanks, O God, with reverence and awe, that before we were formed in the womb, you knew us. Before we were born, you consecrated us. And in our nature, though we are flawed, you love us and you reach down and make us whole. Your love surpasses our understanding and breaks down our inclinations to build walls and set up barriers among us. Through your Son, we know love, grace, and compassion. Through your Son, we are taught to engage with arms wide open to welcome the other. Lord, we pray for our community. We pray for those who have faced a long year of loneliness for those who have been forgotten or treated as unimportant, for those who struggle to know the warmth of kindness and relationship. God, bring your comfort to them and help our eyes to see them, know them, and care for them. We pray for those who battle ailments, physical and emotional. Help them to know they are not alone and they are seen loved and recognized. Lead us to be their strength that we may be present and available to their needs. And for all who face a spiritual wilderness, Lord, be their shepherd. As we journey forth in Lent, help us to engage with the world around us and Scripture in a way that pleases your heart and brings joy to your kingdom. May we plant seeds and grow fruit that feeds multitudes by the ways which we live and love others. May we persist as faithful disciples through the world around us and as that world experiences chaos. May we know your abiding care in the goodness of your grace and love. We pray all this and so much more together as we say the prayer that Jesus taught His disciples saying, Our Father who art in heaven, hallowed be Thy name. Thy kingdom come, Thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. Would you join us in singing together, called as partners in Christ's service.
Now you have heard the word of God. Now may Christ of Nazareth come to you through that word. Speak to you in terms of peace, healing of your inequities and your afflictions, and give peace and joy and rejoicing into your hearts and your minds and your souls. Go in his name. Amen. Amen.